a, a good place to start looking is on the next page, bottom right hand corner is page 13, and right in the upper left hand corner, that first paragraph, the last sentence of the Tennessee Supreme Court says, we do not approve of the continued usage of the, quote, unable to endure it, quote, standard. And it talks on the previous page. I'll let you read that right there. Okay, so the Supreme Court has said, and I think the Supreme Court trumps whoever writes these special jury instructions. They've said, we don't approve of this language, we don't like it, and most people can endure or cope with anything unless it kills them. And so to say you have to be you have to be unable to cope with it to have a, a claim is just wrong. So we suggest that 14.17 be modified a little bit by just taking some words out. If you have 14.17 in front of you, I would suggest the first sentence is fine and the next one that says a serious or severe emotional injury occurs when a reasonable person, that just that whole sentence just needs to come out. And, I'll let you read that. Okay. And then, the last sentence of that paragraph, such serious or severe emotional injury must be supported by expert medical or scientific proof. That's not true either. That's no longer accurate. The cases say, or, you know, the six factors that your honor has approved, you can prove it by lay people, the plaintiff, and you can add in scientific expert testimony if you want, but it's not a requirement. So they've missed the boat. Whoever writes these instructions need to get on the stick and get it done right. This is, this is just wrong. All due respect to them, they work hard, but they can't catch everything. They're just human. Then I agree that the rest of 14.17 can be in there. That'd be fine. Your Honor, if I may, um, there's 20 judges in the state of Tennessee that actually compile these jury instructions. And as I mentioned, it's hard to imagine that they've just somehow missed this for three years. But um, this instruction, we need, we need all. Um, it is the standard. Um, as far as this case this is going, um, the standalone claim, whether or not it is a standalone claim, still has to be established. Um, and that is, a, that is a factor, that there is expert proof, um, and we just, this instruction just needs to come in. Uh, they just simply do not like what the, the, the law is and what it says, but they're going to have an opportunity to explain. I'm going to charge 1417. Thank you, Your Honor. What's left? Oh. On 2.04, which was your charge of absence uh, of a witness, all, all, of the, all of the instruction is witness, and I just think that there's, there's two references to evidence, and that needs to be taken out if the intention is absence of a witness. Let me see. I don't see uh, it's in your charge. 2.04.
what do you suggest for taking it? It's just the absence of witness uh, that are evidence, and then in the first sentence it says absence of the evidence. You just need to say witness on everything to be yeah. consistent with what I understand your ruling was. He wants to absent, he just wants witness, so I can take uh, evidence out. Everybody. John, we, we think it's correct to include, to include our evidence because they claim that Barrett had a confirmation for a king size bed, and they never produced a confirmation of that evidence. And that he was free blocked in a king size room. They made that statement, but there's no <coughs> document that shows it. There's nothing, there's no evidence. I think that's uh, the reason that that should be included. Your Honor, with regard to the confirmation of the reservation, that wouldn't come from either of the two remaining defendants. It would come from Marriott International, a non party. As for the uh, request for a, a, a note noting that he had been pre blocked into a king room you know that they never made a request for that document um, the fact that there is or is not a document is not part of any of the discovery in this matter um, believe me if i had it it would have been blown up and hit more times than every other document i hit in this matter your honor and that's our point if they had it mr ussery got up and showed these housekeeping documents to try to show that it would demonstrate when somebody's pre-blocked into a room. Yet it's curious that what was absent was any housekeeping document indicating that Mr. Barrett was pre-blocked into a room after they argued to the jury that Mr. Barrett had a pre-blocked king room. If there was a document, as Mr. Ussery just said, they would have pre pre prevent presented it. We're certainly free to argue that no such document existed that they, if they had it, they would have presented it, and that the jury can draw an inference based upon 2.04. Your Honor, I, I'm, I'm curious to indicate, are, are the plaintiffs arguing spoliation? Because uh, the, the issues in this case are, and the proof indicate, that the only reason that document isn't here is because the GM died. The reason we have the housekeeping record is because at the time it was produced, as the discovery records make clear, it was obtained in response to a specific subpoena by the FBI. At that time, Mr. Barrett specifically wasn't at issue. It was finding information about Miss Andrews, where she was, who was, where was the rooming list, what was her room status. So the fact that the document had, that we have has Aaron Andrews' room is because that was the focus of the investigation at the time in response to an FBI subpoena. No one ever asked at a contemporaneous time where that record was available for us to produce that record because no one knew at that time that Mr. Barrett was the culprit or that he'd been next to her or that there was an issue with the confirmation of reservation. Unfortunately, the witness died years ago. So to say, to, for them to try to draw a negative inference when, when they never raised a spoliation issue prior to today. Um, I would charge 204 as really. Anything else? As, as you provided to us, is that, I mean, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would say, no, you don't have it. Yeah, no, no, I said that's saying this is what you're saying right. as, as it's written. Yes. Um, but there was. I think it was. Oh. I just wanted to raise up and put it on the record. We had asked for uh, 3.53, which is a claim made against a, a, a non-party. I know that's not, you've already ruled on the issue as far as uh, as, as far as comparative fault uh, on Blackwell and struck that from the answer. But I wanted just to make it, preserve that issue and make sure there was no issue on that. I'm not arguing that. I just wanted to note it on the record. Yeah, they, they raised their objection, and <laughs> I don't think there's anything further. Yet. All right, anything else? Yes, Your Honor. We've got a, um, in light that we're about to go into closing, uh, we would move to prohibit the plaintiffs from arguing a per diem, since this is an emotional distress claim. Um, a per diem uh, is contrary to rule to the TPI that the court is going to charge. The TPI says there is no mathematical formula for computing reasonable compensation. 
What does a per diem do? It attempts to mislead the jury by using a technique that the standard plea can't meet, meaning you cast the pain and suffering as though it was an objective standard that is capable of a mathematical formulation, when in fact pain is subjective and it waxes and wanes over time. And so to put forth a mathematical equation that $5 a day for the rest of her life um, or whatever number they intend to throw out there is somehow a reasonable or fair justification doesn't meet what the actual charge is. It falsely imputes certainty into an uncertain manner of damages, which is very subjective. And what it really is, is an end round around the golden rule. Because what it does is it asks the jurors to think, what would I want to be paid if I were in her situation? What amount of money per day for the rest of my life would be sufficient to compensate me for what this other person, the plaintiff, went through? So we would ask that they be prohibited in their closing from making a per diem argument. Your Honor, we're never going to say, put yourself in her shoes. And how would you feel? We're not going to do that. We've said it from the beginning. So we're not going to violate the golden rule, whatever that strict rule is. We're not going to violate it. But counsel should be free to make reasonable, legitimate arguments using common sense, and to help the jury in its role of assessing damage. So I don't think we should be a muzzle as counsel wants. In the, the court of rules, anything else? So one of the things, I just want to make sure on the jury verdict form, you're not having the foreseeability question. Correct. And, and can I just, for the record, find what the basis for that? Part of negligence. That, they don't want to say it out. You can argue that, of course. But there's, but there is, charge. okay, but I mean, because we had the affirmative defense, plaintiff has actually raised it, there are many well, complaints. Well, we're arguing, I'm just not going to charge it. Okay, that's one. And you know, the one final point is you asked us to add to the uh, innkeeper instruction number four, and I just have a proposal for the court, and I think it's just a... You, you make a copy yeah, of Yeah, I will. Yeah. You know, I just hand, <laughs> I just hand around it if you want to give it to, to the defense, but, uh, or to the court. I'll make a copy of that one. You call yeah. <laughs> but I, it's just a, a general statement, which I think covers, <clears throat> cover our theories without having to go into detail. Are we going to get a copy of all this before we do this? So we yeah, we'll through. take about 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> it's always helpful to know what the law is before you have to argue it. So uh, I'm going to charge the jury and then uh, excuse, excuse them for approximately 30 minutes or so. We've, we've provided food to them in the jury room, and then we'll start the argument after that. Okay. Very good, Your Honor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sure. It, it, has your honor come up with this or? That's, 
That's what he ruled on our, he was including into 3.05. In addition oh, to what's already in 3.05. Yes. Okay, oh, I want to make sure that doesn't relate. 3.05, that was our concern. We'll get all that. We'll do it. Okay. Let me see this. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I mean, we just, other than just a general objection to the whole thing that we noted earlier, yeah, I mean, there's nothing really added by this. So. Okay, uh, I will put it in the first part you know, where it says your first responsibility as fact finder is to determine. We'll put as as a fact finder. You may determine what, if any, protective measures. That would be second. I interpose them. Your, your, your handwritten note will go first. Okay, that's fine, Your Honor. And then I'll take that as your first responsibility. That's fine, Your Honor. Thank you. You have that on the machine? We can do that. Yes, that's first. Wait, wait, wait. Put these in order. This is the case of all the facts. No, no, that's just that's the only last page. So this should be one, two, three, and this should be one. So, so we're doing these three and that. Okay. You may also get to make sure you're doing this. Before we take a short recess. I, until we get everything to look at it, I think we're pretty much done. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll bring it back to you. Okay. Oh, okay. Your Honor, I just have one other thing. Sorry. 2.40. Oh, uh, Correct. Burden of proof, preponderance of evidence. You, you've given us a uh, printed out proposed instruction. One that West Bend was the principal winner. That's fine. We think uh, the next line it does say now that Windsor, for instance, and West Bend, for instance, were negligent. There's no theory that West Bend was negligent. So we believe it, it should read somewhere in here that the plaintiff can recover damages from Windsor even if you find that it was not the agent of West End. Even if you find it. Somewhere we can work with this concept anyway. Number two would be you've got that Windsor, for instance, and West End were negligent. I think it'd be good to say that Windsor was negligent. Because the theory is that when they're negligent, West End will be responsible if Windsor is the agent. So somehow that needs to be communicated in there, and they, they could find that. Could, could it just be, and if West End is an agent? No, 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 because you, want, you don't want to give the jury the impression that they have to find that, West, that Windsor was the agent of West End in order for them to find against Windsor. So, so but number two says that Windsor, and then there's a parenthesis, and then it'd be and or also or something of that nature if West End is an agent in parenthesis. Okay. Say that again. I'm sorry. Okay. No reading. Uh, well, at number two, if it said that Windsor, and then parenthesis, and if West End 
is an agent or something. We can word it yeah, however. Well, you know, the question is, you have to first prove that Windsor was negligent before West End can be responsible. I think we all agree on that. So it should say that Windsor was negligent. Next, the plaintiff can recover damages from Windsor even if you find that it was not the agent of West End. In a number that says plaintiff has, has to prove that Windsor was the agent of West End. Somehow we have to communicate that. Okay, that's how we're going to do it. We're going to let y'all sit down and figure that out. Okay. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Good. Well, okay. I, I'll just play with your law degrees. You can do that. <laughs> we'll figure I'll it out. I'll just do it out there, you know. Okay. We'll work on it. Okay. Thank you, Why don't y'all do that now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what you're saying and you the concept here is that